Hi, everybody. How's everyone doing? Fine. Everyone doing okay? Who's in the house? Hi, Alexandra. Brock, good morning. Kevin, how are you, buddy? Arena. Oh, thank you. You have a nice trading day, too. So far, it's going okay from the sale in Euro at 2211. Uh, Arena. Henrik, nice to meet you. Hugo, how are you? Hi, Scott. My trading warrior brother, TJ, what's up? Hello, Sinatra and Ren and Didier. And everyone else, oh, thank you very much. So uh, on the Euro, I'm looking for, let me get rid of this, go to daily. I'm figuring about 2060. We'll see what happens against the 50-day uh, moving average here. Okay, I expect that to be tested. Takes that out, then we're talking about something, you know, maybe back to this previous high. I'm not sure this is the big turn in the euro. I mean, we could go 120 and then still get 125. And, you know, this could also be it for the rally in the Dixie back towards... Uh, you know, this 90, I know a lot of people looking for bear market rallies I have for months back to about the 95 level. So we'll see if this is it or, you know, there's one more shot down. Uh, dollars doing nothing wrong, just had a little two day pullback and, you know, similar situation in the yen and you know, maybe get one more like ABC, but the yen is still threatening. Okay. It's still threatening there. And, you know, the trading in the stock indexes has become so muted. You know, this could still be a descending triangle, right? If it's a, you know, I mean, how long has it been without a new high? You know, normally we get new highs every day. So, you know, this high was, uh, looks like January. No, that can't be right. Yeah, January uh, twenty January eighth. Okay, so you know it's been four days. Still could do it, but it also could be a descending triangle. Um, you know, this was a stop hunt, so maybe they need to take the stops out here too. But you can't rule out that it's a failing rally in S and P's, and actually Nasdaq is a little weaker. Okay, so. Uh, from this uh, sell-off here, uh, we're only getting minor retraces here in um, NASDAQ. So NASDAQ weaker on the recovery, okay? So what I'm talking about as far as it being weaker is uh, the recovery in the S&Ps has recaptured more of this little dip than the NASDAQ has. And if we start taking out 12.8, which, you know, isn't 100 points away, it's going to look pretty negative where this might be, if you're a bull, A, B, C down here. So have a piece of the NASDAQ on as well. Um, commodity currencies, I, I kept thinking there might be one more high, but, you know, they're, they're not... Uh, looking like that. And in fact, TJ pointed out to me somewhere else yesterday that Kiwi is starting to look like a head and shoulders formation. So as you can see, TJ, I pay attention to everyone. We learn from everyone. So, you know, maybe this is a neckline right here in the Kiwi. Yeah, we've got maybe. that too. Yep. You got it? I'm actually, it's on my screen um, as, I, as, oh. as you're talking, but yes, I, I agree with that. Okay, so, you know, you don't know if uh, the right shoulder is fully developed, you know, could still do here, still go up here or ABC, but the, it, you know, went from be, being stronger than the Aussie to weaker. So here, here's the uh, Kiwi and here's the Aussie. Aussie is so much closer to the highs than Kiwi. And Kiwi was really leading it for, you know, most of the way up. So to me, this is a little bit of a market message. Uh, with Kiwi being weaker. 
So uh, just wanted to point that out. And these really were um, the strongest currencies against the dollar when the dollar was sliding. So um, be careful with long, uh, with long um, Kiwi, Aussie, may want to take a short uh, in this market too. You know, you're not late and you wouldn't even be late if you just wanted to be conventional, wait for a breakdown, um, but wait for the candle to close under it, okay? Because say, for example, um, I, you don't wait for the candle to close, and a lot of times I don't. You could end up with a situation like this, like for about 10 minutes, the S&Ps look like they were breaking down on this candle. See that? So you need, you need uh, the close of the candle is more important. Uh, try not to anticipate uh, closes to get the edge on things and uh, do what I say, not what I do. Okay, so um, that's my look. Uh, US dollar yen's trying to fight its way back up towards uh, this breakout up here. But this too could also be, you know, um, we could still have one more pull back in here. But, you, you know, over these highs, you can't be bearish yen anymore. And we had a little pause in yields uh, the other day, but, uh, you know, we're still well above the breakout at, at one, right? So um, this to me right now just looks corrective, you know, because I look at the momentum up here, even though we diverged, uh, they're not the kind of divergences I go for. That's too much momentum when you're diverging and the divergent high is above 70. So that's like a 78 reading there. Uh, it would probably be, uh, I would say, you know, sometimes when a country's currency drops and you could remember this with uh, what happened with cable way before brexit but when it was dropping uh, their market actually went up okay so you could have a falling currency and uh, people buy equities for um, inflation for an inflation hedge or almost a currency hedge so I wouldn't be surprised if Kiwi drops that it's not negative for New Zealand country fund. That maybe even this advance has uh, capped uh, performance in uh, New Zealand. Just a guess. Okay. You're very welcome. Okay. So um, VIX, you know, uh, it didn't fill this gap, but you know, I, I'm going to share this with everyone in case we get a continuation of the bull market in uh, equities. I just want to show you the weekly VIX and where there is some confluence. It may not happen, may not get down there. But when we had this uh, huge move during COVID, um, we still have not um, filled the gap, all this action here. All right, and the gap fill would take place at 1820. And then look at the moving average. Uh, I believe this is uh, the 200, the red one, right? Yeah, it's a 200. So you have a gap fill at 1820 and you have a 200 week at 1820 right there. So some confluence of numbers if the S&Ps say, you know, blow out to 3850. A lot of people have been talking about that number. Um, Peter from MCM um, was talking 3850, you know, by late January, February, which he thinks uh, could set the top. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, very good explanation, Sansei, about how a stock market can go up um, when the country's currency goes down. Okay, um, let's see, uh, I started talking about oil, which is has been actually stronger than the S&Ps in here. There's an awful lot of mall here at the high. Let's take a look at some shorter term stuff. Yeah, still a little bit too much mall. And this is a short term as I go 15, so. This could be a descending triangle too, just this little area here. 
I'd be pretty careful being long uh, the oil up here. I like oil long term now. I've been converted. Um, yeah, I think that was a great presentation by Mystery showing the oil gold ratio at the co uh, low of the COVID crash being at a 140 year low, which was, you know, and uh, at that point, um, he sold its precious metal holdings and went into energy related issues. So, and also, you know, Shy Girl flipped uh, last year uh, very correctly to the upside. So, you know, in my intelligence gathering and people that I believe are, you know, good analysts, technicians, tacticians, uh, uh, definitely has turned, has flipped. You know, I know we're all scarred from seeing a commodity go into the negative. But um, uh, this could end up being a better inflation hedge, like uh, Misery said, than gold. So, um, uh, you know, I'd love to see a break. I don't know if I'm going to trade it counter trend. Um, and I'm just taking a shot in NASDAQ today from 12.970 right here that this, you know, bounce might roll over. Just a shot, risk an 80, you know, I'll get out over the new high if it makes a new high. And, you know, that's going to take the S&Ps leading it, making a new high. And I think that's about it. Let's take a quick look at the gold-silver ratio. So this is something I talked about last week that I, I said I'd be careful with this ratio. Um, you know, it does look like a little bit of a double bottom. And if we clear this, um, just a minor retracement we've been here before would take you, you know, back to 82. So if this is bottoming here, your preferred short is silver and your preferred long is gold. And I just want to remind everyone that time's beginning to run short to become a member, to hang out with great traders every day and excellent deals close to 50% off on the yearly. So um, we'd appreciate your business. We don't need it, but we appreciate it. And I think you'll appreciate it because when you, uh, you're either gonna pay the market or you're gonna pay to learn or be around good traders. Um, I think it's uh, cheaper to pay for support and ideas in a, in a great community than it is to pay the markets um, when you're trading in isolation. So don't isolate, collaborate, and this is a great place to do it. And if you're an expert trader and, uh, you know, you remember what it was like when you were going through the struggles. This is also an opportunity for you to pay it forward and, uh, you know, take a few people under your wing and help them that are coming in here trying to find their way as a trader. So, uh, you know, and uh, let's face it, I guess, uh, you know, you could call all of us here at Forex Analytics experts but I, I wouldn't like to not have uh, access to the information of the team here at Forex Analytics. Uh, you know, it's an edge for me. I, I, wouldn't, I could do it, but um, I, it's improved my forecasting and trading capabilities. The markets have so much fun <laughs> with your money. <clears throat> okay, Zig. So, um, Take advantage of it, sign up today. We're near the weekend where you'll have the whole weekend to get used to navigating it on all the different features. And remember that you're getting all kinds of great um, research that would take you, you couldn't do it all yourself every day. Uh, you just couldn't do it all yourself. The team could barely uh, do it all by themselves for just their section of what they do. And plus, don't forget, you also don't have to be chained to your trading station because we have the push alerts that's going to keep you in tune wherever you go. So anyone interested in joining today, raise your hand. 
Okay, Sanan raised his hand. Well, welcome, Sanan. I don't think you're going to. Uh, I think you're you're going to see that it was a good decision, and and also, guys, really in anything, I don't care if you work with an expert money manager, or um, you're trying out a new trading technique or a system. Uh, you really have to give something at least a quarter. Georgie joined today. Thank you, Georgie. Um, you have to give something 90 days at the minimum <clears throat> to really make a valid assessment of its value. And uh, that's all I have to say today, guys. So, you know, welcome here today in face and I'm gonna turn it over to the boss. How are you, Blake? Hey, good okay. morning, Dale. How's it going? Yeah. Good morning. Georgie tested it for a week and found great advice in the chat and platform. Nice awesome. testimonial. Awesome. Awesome. Guy, you're, you want to join too? Beautiful. Okay. So we have some, you know, some people that are getting, taking the step and considering the step and never a better time when you could get right, great, great. You um, know, great insight on sale. Hold on really quick. That's there. my I'm pitch. I'm now I'm so going sorry. back to the dugout. Give me one second. <laughs> now that I threw it, it was a wild pitch. <laughs> I beamed the batter. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to just trying to close out. Uh, I closed out a little Kiwi short. I, um, I, you know, I've had this chart on my screen. Uh, since you know yesterday as well actually amanda i think it was amanda that brought it up and we've kind of been you know just monitoring it and so i've been trying to sell rallies in the in the kiwi and i was i was so i, I sold a little bit earlier at like 97 and i just closed it at 90 no, nothing to write home about but um i'm really gonna get excited about the, the kiwi should we drink should we drop below uh 7150 that's where um well one of the reasons why it's holding up here is because of the breakout point, but I think this is where the neckline is at. So, uh, you know, I'm just kind of playing that to the short side a little bit, especially when the Euro uh, rolled over and you guys see the Euro's breaking down here. That's scary, right? Well, maybe, I don't know. That scared me. It, 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 it like out of nowhere, it just kind of uh, started to roll over and break down and, um, it, it, you know, you didn't have to be in the chat room to know it was about ready to break down. You, I tweeted about it, um, about, uh, what, um, let's see, I can tell you 534, um, 40 minutes ago. So 40 minutes ago it was up here and I'm like, man, it looks pretty vulnerable. And, uh, I, I didn't think we'd crack just like continuous, just like starts, you know, spilling, but yeah, we, uh, we just broke the 161% extension. I, I, I think the, the Euro is at risk of a move back down towards, um, uh, towards the, uh, one, one twenty fifty level now. So, uh, one of the things that you're probably thinking right at this moment is why, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dale, so did you did you uh, hear how many trillions of dollars are going to be thrown our way? By uh, who? Biden? Yeah. No. Does it uh, matter by who? <laughs> oh, yeah, I guess it really doesn't. Because, you know, um, although we do have to pay it back. But true. How, what are we you talking what, about? Dale? Three trillion? That would be long freaking gone. Don't worry about that, man. All Don't right. worry about it. Don't I feel the pressure it. of I, I don't even recycle anymore. I, I, yeah. I stop recycling. <laughs> I don't, I don't like, like, Oh, you know, uh, um, plastic bottles. I just light them on fire out front of my house. It's not my world. I'll be dead. <laughs> my kids are going to have to deal with this crap and they have to deal with That's our deficits. So, so you know what? Live it up, buddy. Live All it. Right, roaring twenties. Let's it live it up. We ain't going to be around some alien covenants are going to come take over the earth in 50 years but hell i won't be here so you know whatever <laughs> i'm yeah. obviously being very sarcastic right now um but yeah i totally agree with you it, but it's two trillion dollars at the number that they're talking about you know um 
uh, that's the that's the the number that's being thrown around. And Biden actually has a press conference tonight at seven fifteen p.m. And so I think the market might be kind of quiet until then. I, but I was saying that earlier, and then you know, like when I got up this morning, I'm like, well. Uh, you know, it's probably going to be kind of quiet. And then all of a sudden the dollar starts moving. And that's scary because if, if, if we get anything that even closely resembles a buy the rumor, sell the news type of event, the dollar could really come out of its shoes. You could actually see the dollar strengthen quite aggressively, especially against a lot of these commodity currencies that haven't moved. Um, you know, but whether you're talking about the Kiwi sitting here, the Aussie, sitting in this triangle. I mean, you got, you got currencies that are really at risk of, 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 of moving. Um, like earlier, if you're, you're in the chat room, I, I bought, uh, you know, I just kind of, I'm long dollar Mexican peso already, but I bought some more down here at 1978. I sold it this morning at 1983, um, right where we're at right now, just a little bit higher, just capture this little move. But these are the ones that I keep adding and I keep buying on dips because I am expecting, you know, a move higher in these, uh, these um, uh, you know, emerging market, well, the dollar against emerging market and commodity currencies, especially if we see a little bit of risk off. I think the risk today is a buy, buy the rumor, sell the news. It ain't going to happen probably right now, but I think it's something that, you, you know, if you're in Europe, it might be worth staying up tonight. You know, staying up and seeing the price action after um, uh, Biden speaks, I think that's going to be pretty key. Anyway, uh, so yeah, Dale, two trillion. Uh, I think it's uh, the the word is. Let's see here. Let me let me. See. I, I I have a couple of specifics. He's going to pursue two separate stimulus bills, a rescue package now and a recovery package later to total two trillion. So, you know, you, you're probably going to get like one point one, one point two trillion now and like, you know, nine hundred billion or whatever later um, and how it's going to be parsed out and and how it's going to work is probably the devil's going to be in the details tonight. But I think. You know the market might be buy the rumor, sell the news on this. So you gotta you yeah. gotta be a um, little heads up tonight. So, what do you think? Well, I think that uh, it's possible <clears throat> that a trial in the Senate could kind of uh, distract from getting the business of the country done. I'm sorry. Could you say that one more time? Uh, a trial, an impeachment trial in the Senate, as uh, Biden, uh, you know, takes over the presidency, I think can be uh, a distraction and make it more difficult for him to get yeah, his program I mean, through right I away. I don't know if I agree with that. I, I, I don't know. Well, because how, I mean, how much attention does he have to pay t- towards it? I, I'm, I'm just... It's the senators, you know, yeah, that are busy. Yeah, I understand that's that. That's what, you know, that's all. No, I mean, if you got it, if you got it... I mean, he, was, he didn't come out in favor of... Uh, impeachment biden yeah. it wasn't well, his you know, uh, you know choice to have this cloud his first hundred days look i'm gonna i'm gonna throw out my personal opinion and i, I was actually just talking to uh, i was actually talking to one of my uh last night i was catching up with one of my oldest friends and then i gotta get into the charts here after this right. but he, he actually lives in point loma um so he's not too far from you dale yeah um, it's nice sir which is in san diego it's like san diego harbor uh, he, he lives up on the mountain there. Um, and, uh, he's, like I said, he's one of my oldest friends. I've known him since we were 10 years old and I haven't talked to him in uh, probably like six months, like really caught up with him. And we talked for like 45 minutes last night. He's a, he's a, he's a very conservative Republican. Uh, he owns, um, a trucking company. He owns a military, um, uh, surplus, not surplus. It, he, he provides, he, he does a lot of military contract work and, um, and and provides a lot of like equipment to the Camp Pendleton and the naval bases right there. And uh, yeah, like I said, we've known each other since we were 10. You know, he's, he's watched my kids grow up, um, even though, you know, whenever I'm in San Diego, I go visit him. Um, uh, it's, you know, I know his mom and dad and all that stuff. So we're really good friends, but he's a, he's very conservative Republican. Um, and we were discussing, you know, uh, politics last night 
and and I you know he he's in the same view I think as a lot of Republicans or the GOP is like you know he, he you know they, they they just don't want like I don't think especially if you're a senator and you're in the GOP you probably are pushing towards uh, impeachment because you, you most politicians don't want to disrupt the way the things are right now. Right. I mean, that, that goes for Democrats and Republicans. They just want to play past the hot potato and throw it back and forth and continue to get money. And, uh, can, you know, I mean, it's corrupt as it is on both sides. That's just the way politicians usually are. So this, the, the disruptor, uh, whether it's a, you know, Trumpism or the tea party, or, you know, I think that most Republicans after the, election or the you know uh, inauguration is probably going to push for some sort of um uh push for a um uh, impeachment just to make sure that you know oh trump doesn't, <clears throat> yeah. trump doesn't but, run for public office again i think yeah mcconnell uh is pretty pissed he lost the senate and uh he says the best way to uh separate the republican party to try and get the party back would be to impeach president trump yeah and i and i think that's going to be generally like probably the attitude again with a lot of uh politicians and here here's the thing though it's not going to influence the the markets at all i mean i i just don't think it will so we don't really need to talk about it i just yeah. i was just I, kind of I pointing know. out because I, I you know i i do talk to a lot of I mean, I talk to a lot of people and I try to get their opinions. And, and then I, you know, I think politicians are generally speaking, just very corrupt people and they don't want change and they want to continue to, you know, to get money from their donors. And, you know, the, this, this disruption for the GOP is probably, you know, a lot of politicians like Mitch McConnell and other Republicans are probably like, eh, you know, I don't want that. I don't want it. To, you know, I want it. I want to go back to the way that things are or were, you know, I think that's what a lot of, people are going to push for so but no one wants to be that no one wants to do it while they're while he's president either you know what i mean so that's why i think it's yeah it's going to be a long drawn out process and it ain't going to affect us at all so therefore let's uh look at currencies and see where we're at right now so um speaking of the euro dollar let's go to the euro as it breaks down it continues to break down lower i think what we have to do is start targeting you know certain areas like you know, 12070. 12070 is also um, it's going to come really close. Well, there's the 12086 is the 88 percent retracement. Then you have 12050 over here, which is the the horizontal support. I think all those levels are within reach. I think they're you know they're doable right now. Um, I'm going to write down 12070 for today because I think it is fairly close. Remember, we're in a range environment. We're not bullish anymore. I mean, I'm bullish if we got back down to 120. I just want to be long down there. But right now, yeah, you got to be a little careful. Uh, resistance today, I think while we're below 12170, you've got to kind of target it to the downside. I'm going to do this real quick for you guys. Steve Stelius, we have we, we have some data coming out, don't we? Uh, jobless claims in just over a minute. Okay, got it. Thank you. Uh, double tops, uh, you know, trying to set up in the cable. Um, this is the 38% retracement is 136. So, whoops. Obviously, 137 is big time resistance. Right. Okay. Aussie. So Aussie is in a triangle below 77.16 would get a little, or let's call it 77.10 because that's a 618. That's going to get a little tricky, you know, if we break through 77.10 here. So, and since we are in a triangle, the top of that triangle is 77.70, basically today's highs. I know anybody who's long right now is probably going, man, I wish we were back at today's highs. I would love to sell up there. Yeah, because it's a triangle consolidation. The problem is, is that we may continue lower. Okay, um, let's go over to the data. We have, here's your data flash that comes with Forex Analytics. Uh, initial jobless claims, 
I mean, th- this should not move the market. It really should. It did come in worse than expected. That I don't think worse than expected translates to dollar weakness. I actually think worse than expected translates to dollar strength because the market would be more thinking, oh crap, we might get some risk off here, you know, and then the dollar starts to firm up as a result. So don't, um, don't, uh, I think you got to be a little careful with, with um, trading, you know, weak data, weak dollar. I think it's opposite right now. So just FYI. Okay. Kiwi, uh, head and shoulder pattern. Uh, I, uh, I forget who Dale said, um, had seen it as well. TJ. Uh, who? TJ. TJ. Well, good eye, TJ. Um, so same thing we've been looking at too. And it, you know, resistance right now is obviously 7240 support is 7150 and, and if 7150 breaks it's going to get ugly in the kiwi and i'm i'm, I'm really really hoping that that breaks down because what what it targets just so you guys know 150 pips yeah it targets 70 60. cents so you know it takes yeah. us right back down to the uh yeah. support here right yep that's really key support so yeah It'll break that too. 7240. Um, it might. Um, I guess so, I've given away my bias. Huh? What's that? I guess I've given away my bias. <laughs> uh, dollar Canadian. So, Dollar Canadian, uh, if you, you know, let's just take you over to last night's analysis. The broken trend line comes in at uh, 126.70 level, which held, and bulls will want this pair to stay above that uh, into tomorrow for a move back to the 128 level. I think last night we went as low as 126.65. So, you know, if you're playing off of that support, I think that's key. I'm just going to write down today's lows. We are in a range. But here comes the butts. This is also a descending wedge once again. So if we start breaking above 127.10, we should get that squeeze back to uh, the squeeze back to um, 128. Swissy. Swissy is within a couple pips of breaking out. Uh, above 89.20, we'll target uh, 89.90. So, oops. You can also claim there's an inverted head and shoulders formation here. All I heard, Steve, from you was, rah, 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 rah. what'd you say? <laughs> Sorry, can you hear me? Now? I can hear you better now, yes. Okay. I, I said that somebody can say that there is some head and shoulders formation here as well. Oh yeah, inverted head and shoulder pattern. Yeah, yeah, I guess you could say that. You know, the, the, this is you could you could obviously say. Yes, um, and you know, so I, I think I think you really have to just continue to target to this this to the upside, basically. You know, so yeah, I'd agree. But, you know, nothing's going to move right now. I, I mean, I, I know we're probing this resistance. I just don't think we're going to break today. I know the euro is probing support and the euro looks like it's going to trade back down to 120.50. And maybe it does just on its own. Um, and that's really the risk, I think, is just the euro looks like it is trying to turn. I, I have to, I, I, I've been putting the dollar Swiss in a bearish trend. It is in a bearish trend, but I'm going to flip it to range. Just because we're starting to see the dollar break higher against other currencies like you know the euro and you know the the, the you know some of the the euro and, and maybe the Swissy, so you know I'm I'm gonna flip it just for now. U.S. dollar Norwegian krona. We are approaching our channel resist or our channel resistance. I'm gonna write down 855. I know I've been writing down 850 or 865 or 860. But it is a de- whoops. It is a descending 
channel. So we have to adhere to the fact that, that, that you know, as the trend line decreases, the your um, resistance is going to decrease in value as well. So support 842. Doing this really quick for you guys. Sorry, we got, you know, talking on a tangent about uh, you know, um, impeachment and, uh, and I, and guys, I'm just going to, I need to throw this out there. I don't know if I, I need, I mean, I said it about the impeachment process. I just don't think it's going to affect the markets. So therefore, what do we care? You know, I mean, I know you guys probably care from a political standpoint, but from markets standpoint, I don't think it's going to have any effect on the market. What the market's really looking at is what's the stimulus from Biden going to be, you know, how, how much is he going to feed the appetite of the market right now? And that's all that really matters. Dollar yen. Um, so the dollar yen, I, I mean, I know we held this 50% retracement here. I really was surprised. I, I'm, and this is, this is the one thing that I'll have to say again about the dollar yen. I'm so glad I'm not trading it. Because if I was trading it, I'd have been long right here at like this 104.10, probably been stopped out at, you know, 104.80. I probably would have turned around and been short for a false breakout, got short, you know, on this breakdown right here at 103.60, stopped out right here at 103.90. And you know what? It's probably funny, but not funny. Some of you guys that are listening in right now that trade the dollar yen are probably going, oh my God, that exactly th same thing had to happen to me, right? You had a breakout. Okay, I'm going to buy the breakout. You buy it. It just breaks down. Then you're like, ooh, it's going to break down because it's got a false breakout. So it's going to break down. You get short, then you get stopped out. And then here we are back at the trend line. It's like, dude, I'm so happy I'm not even trading it. But I'm, I'm sure what I'm saying some of is hitting home to some of you guys thinking, oh my God, I just, I did all of those trades over the last couple of days. And that's exactly the reason why I haven't touched the dollar yen in quite some time. Um, 104.40 and 103.50, you guys have fun with it. You guys hear me say that all the time because I just don't want to deal with it. Well, ooh, 103, I'm sorry, it's 103.50. 10350 10440. I think that's what it is. Okay. Dollar index coming up. Uh, so the dollar index. Uh, here you go, Steve. Here's another you know inverted head and shoulder pattern. If you if you you know want to go there, uh, I just I just think that while we're below or above this downtrend line, you know uh, it's it's in recovery mode. So I think it's more of an eventuality before we break higher it's you know just taking its sweet ass time uh 90 70 is resistance and 90 is support notice how range bound we are in everything minus the s p which i'll do it right now so the s p still bullish 3768, I think we wrote yesterday. That's still or 3767. That's key. It's a 38% retracement. It's bullish. We're still bullish. It just stays above that 38% retracement. Resistance, upper end of the channel comes in at here. Uh, 3840. I know it's above the recent highs, but it's a channel. So a uh, dollar max, did I skip over the dollar max? I did. Where did my dollar max and pesa go? Did it get flipped? Where? Oh, there it is. It's usually near the euro max. I don't know who moved it. That's all right. Uh, dollar max. 1970. Today, 1990. And beyond that is 2020. Okay. Gold. Uh, gold would probably be the least fun asset right now to be trading. 
I say that because look at what's been happening in the hourly charts. That sucks. But this pennant looks like it is breaking. So eight, uh, obviously 1860 is resistance. And then really key support is 1820 now. So we got to really focus there because 1820... 1820 and 1865 and then it is in a, in a range okay there you guys go done finito finished uh steve stelios gentlemen lake hey dale everybody dale. Hey. Coach. hey all right good all right just make it. roll call everybody <laughs> um <laughs> what a what a it's a, a boring session but and it's been a, a very you know slow night. But this uh, this dollar move, what do you guys what are you guys making of the this move in the euro? And it's really not the dollar as a whole. I mean the do, like you know the dollar index is moving, but mostly because the euro. Um, what are you guys making of this? Anything or are you just what are you thinking? Well, I, I personally I don't know what's causing it. I mean we did have Germany reporting. Minus 5% uh, last year GDP growth, or should I say contraction. But um, I don't see what's causing it. I mean, it's not a major move today. So I just think it's just regular fluctuation. I mean, I don't, I don't know what you think, Steve. I think it's a technical pullback so far. I don't see anything, you know, to write home about. And yes, uh, I said both yesterday and the day before that I'm a little bit skeptical about the uh, the dollar move because... Uh, the reason the DXY is moving so far is mostly uh, the euro. So, you know, before I stop being skeptical about a possible rebound, I want to see more currencies participate in this. And so far, other than the euro short-term chart, I don't see any real technical damage. Um, I mean, some of them are testing important resistances but you know we haven't broken out yet yeah um you know i i i, I agree and it's you know personally i really want to be short dollars i i do i i, I want to be short dollars but it, the question is does the euro make it to which you know if you if you look at like just just make this an a b a b c d move right mm -hmm. it takes us back below 120 just slightly. And, you know, I mean, this is, this is one of those things that it's like, okay, take us back down to 120. And in my opinion, take us all the way back down to 119 and really shake out all the people that bought, you know, there's so many, the, the, the consensus trade was buy Euro, sell dollars because Euro is going to 140. That is, and, and you guys remember me saying this the last couple of weeks and the, the end of December, there is not one bank analyst analysis I read for the end of year that was that wasn't the consensus trade. Not one. There wasn't one. There wasn't one that was saying I'm bullish dollars here. Not a one. Uh, all the, uh, of all of the analysis I read. So that consensus trade, you kind of let it have to. You have to let it get turned on its head. Let the euro drop back to one nineteen. Shake out everybody who got long above 120 for the last, you know, few months, especially the ones that were really late taking big, you know, swipes at it at 122 and let them get stopped out. And then, you know, you probably want to be on the other side of that trade. So, you know, we get back down to 119 and I'm, I'm, I'm a buyer down there. So. Yeah. I do think that this uh, sell off uh, is going to produce a buying opportunity. Yeah. Well, good. All right. Well, guys, um, I'm going to pass it over to you. But before I do, let me just say, say a few things. Um, make sure you use this time to um, take, it, take advantage of our pricing that we have with Forex Analytics. This is our, we're running our seasonal special right now. And also, if you want to get Forex Analytics for free um, for a couple of months, potentially, uh, open a Pepperstone account. You have to use this link here. I was, uh, I was on the phone and I didn't tell you, uh, Steve or Stelios this today because I haven't talked to you guys since, you know, I, I talked to, whenever I talk to Chris Weston, it's usually early in the morning for him, late in the evening for me because we're on the opposite sides of the world. Um, and we were, we were talking last night 
And uh, we're going to do a, a, a special uh, webinar um, for yields about yield. So you're going to have to be a Forex Analytics subscriber or Pepperstone um, client to get that first. Um, of course, you know, you know, several days later, you know, we'll post the video, but, uh, you know, we're, we're going to be doing a, a little rundown of what, you know, the yield curves are showing us, what real yields are showing us and how that's going to affect, you know, the dollar moving forward. So uh, I think it's going to be important. But anyway, I was just wanted to mention that because I'm talking about Pepperstone Securities. So um, yeah, make sure you check us out, guys. Thank you so much for being here today. Uh, Steve Stelios, Dale, it's all yours. Thank you, Blake. Thank you, Blake. Thanks Love so today. Hello, everybody. <coughs> hey, Stel. Stel. Another day. What a boring day, actually, so far. Um, we obviously have the uh, the whole issue with Trump and the impeachment, and uh, Mitch McConnell apparently is, is not going to allow it to happen before um, Biden is sworn in. Uh, the question is what happens, you know, because last time uh, we know he, he, he needs, we need to have two thirds of the Senate voting uh, against him. And I think it's, it's hard, even though it's going to be, it's not going to be like it was last time around. I think like Blake said, uh, there's going to be more Republicans voting against him, but still the market probably thinks there's little chance of anything actually happening. But um, yeah, theoretically you know, speaking, even the, if it happens, why, why would the market care? I mean, yeah, you know, it's you know, Trump is he's not, not be president in any way. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, yeah, exactly. But um you know, let's see what happens. You know, what, what I want to see first is a nice transition from Trump to Biden. The market's pricing that in. And, uh, you know, let's see what Biden is going to be doing. And, uh, you know, two trillion is a good start. <laughs> let's, see, let's see what comes Washington, up. Washington, D.C. has never been more militarized for this inauguration. Yeah, yeah. I saw pictures of, uh, you know, special forces or whatever they were. Um, anyway, let's hope it all goes smoothly. And yeah, let's hope. Um, I'm sure it will. Um, but uh, don't so use hope in your trading. Use that hope is for, true. for you know, good outcomes in life, but not for good outcomes in trading. That is true. Um, what else to say? The only other thing of of note, really, to mention is the situation in Italy again. And you know, we've written, we talked about and written about Italy quite a few times, and the, you know, the governments there tend to be quite uh, unpredictable and volatile. And um, we had. Um, a small party headed by Renzi, who used to be the prime minister, um, they pulled out of the coalition. So Conte now, the prime minister, has uh, a problem because he needs this uh, party and the uh, you know the ministers and the, you know the people of this party who are in government. They, he needs them to have a majority. So, but but Renzi, what he's done is basically, I think um, I'm obviously not in Italy, so I can't know exactly. But you know, he's unhappy with the way things have been handled with the whole COVID crisis and everything. And they have withdrawn, but he's left the window open uh, so that if things change. In what way, I don't know. But basically, if he sees some change, they're going to come back in. So, you know, the usual politician thing where you're bargaining. <laughs> it's funny. Actually, it's not funny. Um, it's interesting but, you're talking about Italy, still because uh, my guest, our guest, um, that's going to be on today, if he shows up, um, has been forecasting a European crisis this spring with the epicenter being Italy and the Italian banking sector. Yeah. Well, it's interesting anyway. to see what's, what's, uh, what's wrong with the Italian banking sector that isn't wrong with the banking I guess sector of even almost worse. every country. Yeah. I, I, worse. And, and I can't, I'm not making fun of the Italians, obviously, because I'm Greek and we're worse. But, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a volatile environment in politics there and things are shuffling around a bit. But, you know, I don't think there's going to be a major issue, hopefully not, but, you know, just yeah. something to keep in mind for the euro. And, uh, you know, right. if something, something materializes, then the euro might be under pressure. Um, good jobless claims we saw. Nothing else data-wise today. Not that it matters anymore. And Paul, is Paul speaking later today? I think Paul's speaking. Uh, I'll have to check. I think so. But anyway, um, other than that, you know, equities are flat. Metals are kind of flat. The euro is the only one. Actually, no, 0.3%. Nothing really. I mean, I have nothing to say, unfortunately. Uh, it's, it's a very quiet day, and hopefully we get something going into tomorrow's close of the week. But uh, we've got nothing today. Yeah, I think the market is... Uh... 
is waiting to see how much it will get from Biden. Um, yeah. Scott so, says. Uh, Scott says. By the way, are Italian banks better than Greek banks? I don't think there are any banks in the world better than Greek banks. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> every <laughs> every other every other bank in the world is better than a Greek bank. I'm not. I'm not sure problem. about that anymore, Stelio. They're bad. Well, yeah. They're really bad. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but I'm not sure the Italians are uh, are better. They might not be. Right. Uh, but what I agree with is that basically leave the economy function freely and I don't think there is probably any uh, banking sector in any country that's that's going to be going to survive yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah um, so that's all you need to know about banks um, banks in essence are like a comatose patient that you're keeping alive uh, just to harvest his organs at, at some point. And in, in the case of this analogy, it's just for them to be an extension of governments and uh, tax authorities. Th that's what they are. Uh, because having to do with their actual banking activities, you know, year by year, they do less actual banking activities. And having to do with their balance sheets, they're totally, totally effed if things normalize at some point. Yeah, bad loans and all that. And remember the, the, the saying, uh, the 363 uh, things. You, have you heard that about banks? You, no. you borrow, borrow 3%, lend at 6%, and be on the golf course by 3 o'clock. By 3, oh. yeah. But that, <laughs> that no, no longer works. Uh, it even no though, longer exists. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And, uh, and lending is very low. And I mean, here, especially in Greece, they just don't want to lend. Uh, unless you have, you know, big collateral and stuff, and I'm sure. Yeah, unless you have people. enough money to not want, to not need any, want. any, uh, yeah, to yeah, not exactly. want or need to 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 borrow. Yeah. Even <laughs> then for you like can't car actually... loans, guys. Even for like car loans. Uh, car loans you can get, but it's uh, again you need to have, um, you know, you pay big upfronts and all that. You know, basically they want to protect themselves as much as they. Can. Yeah, and the and the interest actually is not cheap uh, no, because not. Be, be, because because they're risky. Yes. Yeah, and you can't write off the interest, right? No. No. Yeah. Okay. No. How about real estate? Uh, yeah. Still, you need. Again. Very yes. Still, you need to have collateral. Yeah. Uh, you need to pay up, uh, pay pay up front a decent percentage. Like twenty percent uh, down or something. Yeah. At least okay. at the very, very, very least, and yeah. it depends no. on the real estate. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Uh, so, um, as Telio said, things are slow. The cable is finding resistance again in this channel. We talked about the importance of this area yesterday. So, you know, this is still playing out. USD knock, USD CAD, still toying around with resistance areas, unable to break higher. Aussie. Kiwi haven't broken lower. That's exactly what I mentioned before when I said that I, I, I remain very skeptical about a you know generalized dollar um, rebound as long as uh, nothing is actually technically broken with the exception of the euro. I think the euro is having like a healthy corrective move lower and we know how much it influences DXY since DXY is really, really heavy euros. So I don't think you should be, um, you know, jumping on board this move, hoping that everything else is going to follow. It might, but I want to see more technical moves before I say, yep, okay, the euro was just leading the way um, and now everything else follows suit, especially ahead of today's announcement. Um, my intuition tells me that there is a higher chance, but that's pure intuition, right? So I'm just saying that, that there is a higher chance that Biden is going to positively surprise the markets than disappoint them. Uh, so since that's my gut feeling, I, you know, I, I find it quite hard to want to fade ahead of Biden's pitch risk uh, or uh, be long dollars, right? I mean, even if you go want to go to 
short-term time frames. Here's the S&P, for example. I see nothing bearish here. I see nothing bearish in this recent move. If, if there is anything you can say about this recent move, doesn't really matter how you draw the trend line resistance. It's too early to know. But uh, I mean, there is no way you can read it as a bearish reversal, right? Anything can happen. But so far, what I see here is consolidating prior gains and nothing more than that. And uh, it looks to me like market participants are just looking for an excuse to just buy more. Um, and as I said, if Biden gives them, if Biden at least does not disappoint them today, so if Biden doesn't put a, an obstacle, a barrier to, to this uh, positive attitude, I, I think we should see uh, a continuation higher in risk assets. And I don't really see how risk assets are going to be moving higher and the dollar really be rebounding higher. Um, uh, and I, I'm talking more generalized about the dollar. Uh, and, you know, I, I, dis I, 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 I differentiate from the DXY specifically for the reasons we mentioned all these days, because it's euro heavy. And yes, the euro is a little bit heavy at the moment. And this creates this rebound, which might create a little bit the impression of like a, you know, dollar reversal. But looking at all the charts, there is no dollar reversal to talk about yet. Okay. So um, now going to the rest of the assets like crude oil. Crude oil, I, I talked yesterday during the webinar actually about the importance of the area that we had just tested like an hour ago. Um, I, I said that that was a you know, a, a beautiful confluence of resistances. And so far it has worked really nice. We got rejected from uh, 54 and we're now almost two dollars lower. Now, is this the high? You know, it's, you know, playing this game, trying to call the high every time you have a pullback is a very dangerous game. Uh, if you wanted yesterday from a risk reward perspective to be short, it made sense. And, you know, it, it still makes sense. I mean, there is there is the potential of seeing some type of a corrective move. Um, now, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit skeptical for the reason I mentioned before. We know that crude oil is nicely correlated with risk assets. I don't know ahead of today if I would want to be short risk assets. Sometimes crude might be leading. Uh, sometimes it's following the S&P. Um, who knows? This time it might be leading. Uh, I'm paying close attention to it. So far, a nice rejection, but I want to see a lot more than that before I can, you know, draw any conclusions and say, oh, yeah, that was it. We we did see a short-term uh, high and now we're he headed lower. Um, we need a little bit more price action. Here is gold, you know, holding the 61.8, but I have to admit that price action in the short term during the past three, four days has not really been the type of price action that you expect to form some type of a bottom. So I wouldn't be surprised if there is more downside uh, within the context of this uh, corrective move. But on the other hand, it's silver. As I've said, there is, there is this, this divergence, which is a little bit troubling to me. One has broken higher from uh, its channel and has retested it and still holding the other one not. So, so far, silver seems to be overperforming. Which of the two is actually telling the truth? I think we're going to find out quite soon. I'm not in a rush because in any case, I'm not looking to be short any of the metals. I'm just looking to be short, uh, to be long. I'm anyhow long physical uh, gold and I'm hoping that I'm going to manage to buy uh, silver at better prices as well. I don't know if I'm going to manage to do that, but I'm hoping. Um, now, having to do with platinum that somebody else asked here, look at platinum. Perfect retest of the broken bull flag and already recovered almost to the highs. As I've said, I think that platinum looks really good. Uh, I, I think it's a very, very, very high probability scenario that we've seen at 560 the low. And I think there is a lot more upside in the months and years ahead for platinum. So I think that 
uh, having to do with platinum, uh, by the dip mode is the mode somebody should be into. Now, copper, I've, um, I've stressed out the importance of paying attention to copper. Uh, copper is still riding this ascending wedges trend line support. Um, I think technically a breakdown from this trend line is going to be significant and it's going to um, affect my thinking about other assets as well. Uh, but for the time being, that's not the case. We haven't broken down. So I'm, 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 I'm paying close attention to it. Um, keep in mind, there is also the chance that we can just you know, like accelerate higher and break through resistance, right? So, um, I mean, uh, assuming that it's going to break down is not a good idea. I, I want to see it happen. I want to see a daily close below before I can actually, um, you know, feel more confident about uh, a potential downside from here. Guest we, do have, we do have a guest, uh, Dale, right? Yes. Yeah, I just saw yes. the clock. Okay. Okay, cool. All right. Um, so, more tomorrow. Okay, thank you, Steve. Thank you, Dave. Hello, Thomas. Going to get you set up here. It's interesting. We were talking about Italy today, so I have some questions for you. Happy New Year and welcome back to Face, Thomas. How are you? Oh, I'm 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 doing fine, thank you. We are oh. we have gotten a really big pile of snow in Helsinki during the last two days. So, oh know. yeah, no, no, makes no, sense. No. What if you if you don't have snow in Finland? When when will you where will you have snow? <laughs> no, but we we don't always have snow in Helsinki. Actually, last year we really didn't have. So we'll yeah, see. you see, it's weather weather is really changing. I was on the bits. Most of the days in uh, during the Christmas holidays, which yeah, okay, Greece is a much hotter country, but still making you know having Christmas days on on the sea is not something that's quite usual. Yeah, oh, you're on uh, the beach. Uh, I thought you said something else. Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. no. <laughs> All right. Uh, anyway. <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, uh, Thomas. So, uh, if you want to share your screen. Yeah, I have actually, I have, uh, yeah, I have a few slides, but uh, if you want to talk about Italy, that's okay too. Yeah, I, yeah. So uh, one of my colleagues was talking about that uh, Renzi is uh, stirring up some things in Italy, and uh, I brought uh, you up and yeah. uh, that you're looking for the epicenter of a euro crisis to begin in Italy uh, because of their banking. Uh, yeah. situation and my other colleague who just asked you about the snow said what makes italian banks any worse than any of the other european banks can you answer what, that for him what what makes them worse well they well they are in the worst condition they were in the worst they have been in a rather bad condition since the 2008 crisis they didn't they really didn't handle uh the 2008 crisis very well and then if you look at the the um, growth or the performance of the Italian economy since, well, 2000 yeah. even, it has been rather dismal. And they have had several like uh, regional banking crises over the years, at which they have all, always resulted uh, as, you know, means of bailout. And now with the massive hit of the coronavirus last year, the lockdowns, and the, the, they basically lost the whole tourist season last summer. So there will be a, a massive... Um, um, kind of losses uh, incurred from that to the banks. And the, we, we, know, we know already that they, um, they had a, a quite high share of non-performing loans. Uh, yeah, the same, loans. the same is the deal in Greece. But the problem, Thomas, is that uh, governments are just keeping all these zombie corporations and banks alive yeah. by, by injecting, by throwing good money after bad. And especially now with the COVID excuse, they've in essence unleashed all the barriers to do so because now they even have like an official excuse why things are failing and why they should be supported. 
That's true. But the one thing is that people don't really understand, that uh, don't often understand that the governments and the central bank, there is a section of the banking sector which the governments and, and the central banks have no access to, and it's the interbank markets, where basically bank, banks lend to each other. And it's based all on the trust. And if that's broken for some reason, then the banking crisis emerges immediately. That's what okay. happened in 2008. So, and, and let's, right. just think, let's just think but, the political situation in Italy for a moment. If okay. you consider that it would result to a situation where Italy could leave the euro. And let's say you, have, you are a bank in Switzerland and you are lending to a bank in Italy overnight. But if, if there's a risk that Italy leaves the euro, why would you lend to an Italian bank even overnight if it would mean that the next day you will get the, your money back with the uh, 40% discount Erica? or something like that. Okay. So that's all that, all that is needed, the breaking of trust. Wouldn't the ECB step in? Uh, we had the same situation here uh, a year ago in the fall uh, with mm -hmm. our repo market, and that's when the Fed came in, started to expand their uh, balance sheet because the overnight repo market uh, yep. uh, spreads were going up. So the Fed was able to ameliorate that. Would the ECB be able to be as effective as the Fed was to calm it down? No, the thing is that the repo market is it's kind of a public market what comes to the compared to the interbank markets. So interbank markets operate just between the banks, and they okay. you know they, they settle they, uh, their overnight loans basically or or the requirements of the um, what's the word? Well, anyway, they they need to have the, this certain amount of money at the end of its, its business day. And they, 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 they use that, but they also acquire longer loans, uh, terms with longer, uh, loans with longer terms. So, and that's the okay. thing that it's not, there is, there is no way central bank can access that market. It can, all, it can only try to support the banks, but it cannot force banks to lend. While with the repo crisis, it actually could force the primary dealer banks to lend. But in this case, it cannot. So it's a, and especially in Europe, we don't have a uh, such a, a large primary dealer bank system. So it's it's just something that the ECP cannot do. Okay, all right. So the backstop that we have here in the U.S. Uh, could, would yeah, our and, Fed, and, would and our, unless because I remind but, you that I'm Greek and we went through the Greek crisis during mm -hmm. which a lot of unprecedented things happened mm -hmm. uh, until the crisis was actually resolved. So. You know, there is always the counter argument that, you know, in times of crisis, you can see actually all those institutions like the Fed did in March, build uh, tons of new facilities, uh, you know, out of nowhere within a day. So, you know. Yeah, that's true. But, but the, 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 let, me, let me be clear. The interbank market operates in, uh, uh, on trust between banks and if that's broken there's no way any outside institution can fix it so it's a trust market just purely so that's the thing and it's there is no way you can build the trust there if, if it's lost between the banks so that is the, that is the black horse or the here or you know the black sheep swan swan yes one or sheep yeah, right, sheep, yeah. But, yeah. so that's the, that, that's how it goes. Or the horse of the apocalypse, the horses yeah. of the apocalypse, huh? <laughs> yeah, the horse of the financial apocalypse. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right, many so dates, many go names ahead. can be invented. Yeah, yeah. So uh, anyway, we're looking at uh, uh, Italy on the chart that you have here. Is it at the bottom? Uh, yeah, the weakest recovery uh, in the first week of January. Okay. Um, and you had a massive, massive fall in, in, the, in the Christmas holidays. Italy is the yellow one here. So okay. it, it, it took a, a massive dive. And now oh, it's recovered that, already yeah. there. About, yeah. But, it, you know, just, just if you compare, if you look at the beginning of last year, everyone was around the 100 level of the index. Right, right. And now we are between 40. And, and you know, there's one country, Spain, which is in the close to 80. But... This is a massive, like, steep drops in the economic activity. The Bloomberg doesn't actually tell what's in it precisely. They're just, there is some credit card data, people moving around data and stuff like that. But still, they, 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 these stuff, you know, we, we know tomorrow we actually get the new ones, but it, it, a massive drop in the uh, 
during the Christmas holidays. And it's t- economies are not meant to sustain such deep drops in economic activity. They just aren't. You know, the incomes of corporations just goes haywire, and then you cannot pay back the debt. And you know, and the thing is, what comes to Italy actually that they have be, they have uh, had the debt uh, debt moratorium in place uh, begin of was it uh, June, and and they are they start to end around now, and they 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 should be scaled back uh, 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 within a six month period. But they're just going to end it all. Well, we'll uh, see. We don't know. Once we, we, or gradually? Gradually. Gradually okay. between now and, and, and June. And this was year. for what? Real estate or all forms banks. of debt? Banks. All, debt. All, okay. all, all, bank, all bank lending. I see. So, okay, and they, so they, there was like none. Like the, and the European Central Bank has actually been really worried, also in private discussions with politicians, that, that what is happening under the moratoria or the or the blanket of moratoria. So what is building there? And they will say, yeah, actually, just was it a week ago? There was a uh, uh, there was a questionnaire made on uh, on the Finnish corporations and how they see their near term future. And was it that there is there's a risk of was it like twelve thousand Finnish companies failing when the moratoria lifted? That's a massive number. We usually have a 1,000 to 2,000 bankruptcies per year. Mm-hmm. So, and this is a this is a gun of a time bomb that is waiting in every corner of Europe at least. So, when the moratoria are gone, the bankruptcies may start coming in fast, and okay. that would mean massive increase in unemployment and you know and, and more problems for banks. So, what the governments and the central banks have essentially built is a is the kind of a a uh, massing of complete financial destruction. These, these, that the dead moratorium was a very, really bad idea, really bad idea, because now we don't know where the economy actually actually stands. So it, it's a, it's something that should, should scare us all because it can start really fast when it gets going. You know, the tipping, uh, the tipping point. Could the tipping point be political? You know, yeah, it could uh, be political. Cover. It could be economic. Yeah. Just to, that the companies start failing, or it could be financial. Financial markets could crater in, and there's a you know, or then the, then just the trust in the banking sector broke. It can start in, in a in a multitude of directions. We actually in in our December of forecasting report, I can show you the forecast at the end. But we 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 kind of found that it's impossible to forecast the growth rate of the economy for the next few years, because there's so much uncertainty. Right. So, you can, of, of course, you can throw, you know, throw some numbers, but you could just roll a dice. It's the same thing. We just don't know. There is so massive uncertainty around. It's insane, actually. Okay. So, um, uh, what kind of signs are you looking for? And uh, uh, how are you going to position yourself for this, Thomas? Uh, uh, I know you were talking in the spring. Uh, you know, a lot of people are bringing up the spring for a lot of yeah. different cycles. Yeah. In you know, in the across the board in different markets. Yep. The dollar, uh, equities. Um, you know, by then, you know, what's uh, could be ironic is that maybe um, when people think everything's going to be okay or better because of vaccines. And the economy is being able to open up, that there'll be a sense of optimism, and then this thing happens, uh, the solvency issue yeah. begins to happen. Um, you know, instead of it happening at the bottom of COVID uh, in March, that yeah. you know maybe we've overcome it. Do you see that as a possible scenario? Uh, you know, uh, COVID being handled, and uh, that's when people will least expect any kind of economic problems that's that's the risk because the thing is that even if someone would snap their fingers and the coronavirus would disappear tomorrow the economic hit has already you know it has already come so we we cannot escape it it can it can of course get worse from here but if you look at this just look at this like numbers if you if you consider it in april and may the economic activity decreased at 20, close to 20%. You know, that's a, just con- consider it for a while. So basically, 
fifth of the economy or four fifths of the economy just disappeared for a while. So you, the economies cannot function in these states. You know, they, you you get you get massive defaults, failures, stuff like that. And now they all have been masked by the moratoria, by the massive um, borrowing by the central uh, of governments and the and the monetary still stimulus by central banks. If you just look at this, the, you know, the, the balance sheets of major central banks, right. look, the Fed is the green one. It's, yeah. it's a ridiculous increase. ECP balance sheet is pushing up all the time. You know, these are, these are, these are actually there's billions of, uh, billions of uh, dollars. And the interesting thing is that the balance sheet of the Bank of China is not moving much. But, you know, these are, if, if you just look at the Fed, it issued, yeah. a, a, like, in, within four months, the balance sheet exploded from around what, right. 4.4 billion to over 7 trillion. I mean, trillion. So right. it, it, a massive increase. Insane, really. And it, it, that, that was the point when the Fed es- essentially take over the U.S. financial system. And how long can they keep doing it if, you know, the next time the market breaks, so what happens? So people are putting a lot of faith on the central banks, but actually they, we, we, you, cannot, you cannot guarantee that they can keep this up. You know, you cannot, you cannot just push the markets up by liquidity alone. It just doesn't happen. You know, you, you, can, you can push a, a kind of liquidity-driven uh, mania, which has happened like many times, like in 1928 and 1929, and, and we know how that ended. Well, don't you think we're getting that with some of the IPO action here in the U.S.? Of course. And- of course we, we, are, we are in a massive bubble. And if you just consider it, what asset class does not look like it's in a bubble. If you know, credit markets are a bubble, stock markets are a bubble, real estate is in a bubble. So it's a, uh, it's a everything bubble uh, uh, as was you know uh, uh, titled so about years ago, a few years right. ago by some. But now we are really there. It doesn't make any sense. The economy has kind of collapsed already, but it's it's it has been masked, and then the central banks and governments have pushed massive amounts of debt in the the economy just to make it appear that we are recovering and that's that's a, that's a mirage a dangerous mirage so we are not worried actually that there will be a, a economic crisis we are worried that there will be a complete implosion of the global economy that's our worry now and it's just and, and people seem to be walking around that like there's nothing major happening we will recover from this but no you just, they haven't really looked under under the surface or the, under the hood of the global economy, and it's it's not good. Let me let me show another example. If you think okay. about the manufacturing recovery in okay. in the world, well, it's driven by this. This is the cumulative aggregate finance into the real economy of China, and the green one is last year. And if you oh. notice, this has been China has been recovering only by the massive increase in the debt issued uh, pushed into the economy credit and stuff like that. So this will, this is a measure that tries to take uh, account every, uh, every uh, kind of, um, every line of, of, a, um, of debt that is issued in the economy. And now currently, the debt levels in China's economy are growing three times faster than the GDP. You don't have to be a, you know, financial wizard to understand that that's, that doesn't, you know, that, that is not sustainable. And if you, call, if you think about that, that the Chinese economy is heavily indebted already, and they're just pushing more debt, debt on, on, on top of the already massive debt pile. So um, it's a, yeah. Yeah, it, yeah it, you know, uh, it's everything can be okay, okay, okay. And then there's that one tipping point moment. Could the tipping point moment, uh, what gives us a shove, that people are finally waking up to that rates may actually be heading up. Uh, you know, the 10 year in the U S broke yeah. out over one uh, BIPs uh, and hasn't closed back under it. It's pulling back a little now, but you know, if we're on our way to uh, two and a half, three, how can economies, uh, even the U.S., what that's going to cost the U.S. in interest payments, a uh, tripling from 0. 0.4, 0. 0.5 to even one and a half, yeah. could be burdensome, couldn't it? Could yeah, it, it's it's it, it could be a massive burden. And the thing is with these like asset market manias is that they they just it can be anything that finally breaks them, and then then they when they start to like 
fall the prices, then they just keep on falling because the, you know all, all the people or the investors who have uh, leveraged up, they have to sell and you know they, they quick, quick, quickly become say a fire sale. Can you uh, uh, define for our audience the difference between a liquidity crisis and uh, what's the other word? Uh, uh, Solvency, liquid- huh? Solvency. Solvency, exactly, yeah. Thomas. Yeah, well, what's the well, difference? Yeah, well, if you well, that's a um, yeah, that this is always a tricky thing. But uh, liquidity is something. If if you consider, for example, a bank, liquidity crisis is when you don't have enough um, uh, cash to give it to depositors who are taking it away. While solvency crisis is when when your uh, business model has failed, so you are in a bankrupt in, in a bankrupt state. Okay. So that's okay. the basic difference, and it applies. Okay. It, it, it's of course a different different thing with investors, but basically the same thing. So okay. liquidity is just when you can kind of in, liquidity crisis emerges when you suddenly cannot, uh, let's say, roll over your debt. Right. And, and the solvency crisis uh, appears when you cannot pay that debt from your income stream. Okay. All right. So, so, that, know, just small, adding, that, really, so really that's true. your point. Is that your point about the Fed that they can be successful at solving liquidity issues, but not yeah. solvency? Yeah, that's my point exactly. And that, that's it's you don't it's it's never a good idea to try to fix an over the uh, over indebted issue with more debt. That's like the basic logic of life. Everyone understands that. But that yeah. has that is exactly what has been done. If it just I just this is a government debt to GDP ratios okay. in in the euro area and in the United States really uh, uh, as a share of GDP very high before yeah. the crisis. Uh, well, the decline in in euro area is basically just a uh, just Germany and Spain, but for example, the US and, and and then a big spike upwards to really high levels. And now, if you just think that, well, how how will governments go with these debt levels? They cannot if, if the central bank is not pushing the interest rates down. So this creates a really, and the thing is now that many don't understand. If you look at the finance the history of financial crisis, never ever have we been in a situation where there is, the, uh, there is an over indebted issue in, uh, in governments and corporations at the same time globally. So okay. they may have been ex, uh, existed in, in one country at a time, but it's a global problem. It's really, it's really a massive thing, you know. If I've been, I did an, uh, I've been doing academic research on, on economic crisis for ten years, and this is the, the situation has never been worse than it's now. And the thing is that when when corporations have a lot of debt, like they have in the U.S. Uh, also in the eurozone, but more in the U.S., when the, when the recession comes, they usually the recovery starts from the. Uh, from the fact that the gov- uh, corporations have room to leverage themselves up to take more debt. Now they don't have it. The other option is that the government is, is, uh, has a low debt level and it can support the economy when, it, when the uh, recession or the crisis is deepest. Now we don't have that either. And also we tend to have a uh, interest rate rather high when we go into crisis, which then can be lowered by the central bank. That's gone too. And in, in top of that, we have a weak banking sector in Europe and a very and asset markets in, in, in this everything bubble. So if you if you look at the whole picture, you, you, you should be able to understand that the complete implosion of the global economies is actually frightening possible. It can happen this time around. And it's it's a really, really worrisome thought. But this that's the only conclusion. You can come up if you look or if you put this all these uh, um, topics in their own baskets and then compare and combine on the same basket and then look what you see. You you cannot you cannot find you cannot have any other conclusion than that. Well, um, that's are, are you a reader of Jeremy Grantham? Uh, actually, no. Okay, because he's uh, called bubbles before and. And crashes before. I, I'm not sure if that's his first name, but I know it's Grantham, and he's been on CNBC. And it was a few no, months okay. ago. Yeah, oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, actually, I am. Yeah, 
Yeah. Okay, good. Because he was saying, and this is before you know there was uh, an even more pronounced move, uh, and this was after the recovery in COVID. He he was saying that it's uh, that the U.S. Uh, and stock traders have the chutzpah, which is kind of a Yiddish word for nerve. Have the nerve to uh, you know put a bubble a stock market bubble on top of this economic yeah. backdrop. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, the market kept going. He's saying you can't call a top uh, with this information, but uh, there's definitely um, the conditions are ripe for this being one of the biggest bubbles ever in economic history. Yeah, that's I, I we actually fully concur with that. So this is a real this is really dangerous situation. That's like, you know, and it's, it, I don't know wh where you can put the money at the moment. If you, what do you think well, is going to happen to the dollar during this? Will the dollar benefit from this well, European crisis? Yeah, well, that's, yeah, that we don't, if you look at the political situation in the US, it's, well, you know what it is. So, yeah, I know what it is. Uh, yeah, and, and before we thought that when the European banking crisis begins, the dollar will be the safe haven for a while at least. Now yeah. we cannot guarantee that either because we don't yeah. know how the you know how the situation is going to play in the US on the ground. So that's a uh, that's a really tricky question. We it's you know it's it's hard to um, it's hard to see what could happen in a in a, in a you know uh, it would it could it act as a safe haven? Sure, could it not? Possibly. So. We are in a, we are a really strange thing, a, a situation actually, where there's really few places you can actually trust that will hold their value. Gold being the the the, 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 the blue chip. Yeah, and and yeah, and and then if you look at the Bitcoin, it's well, it's, you know, tulip mania ring any bells? So it's a, I don't know. It's they, they, these are these are strange things. Okay, strange, things, strange times. Yeah, they so uh, strange times. Um, uh, excellent presentation about what's going on. What do you have here? Guesstimates. Uh, yeah, this is, this is actually I just saw this uh, until the end. We have this is okay. our forecast in uh, forecasts in January. So we okay. assume that the European banking crisis will start uh, not next year, this year actually, Q two, and they are based just on the on the uh, the, the moratoria drawn. And but the thing is that the. The, like we mentioned in the end of the assumption, the massive economic, political, financial uncertainties, regress, forecast as guess estimates. And this is just something we throw around. We, this is, but this can go either way. But the point here is that it's really, it's basically impossible to forecast what will happen next year or this year, I mean. So, okay, and uh, what do you think the chances are, I mean, we always extend things when things look bleak of the debt yep. moratoria being extended. Yep. Uh, the recovery fund of the EU, EU is ratified. Yeah. 50, so 50 that that happens or but both higher. happens. I don't know. The, the, I don't know. 50, 50. I, I think that's probably the best guess now, you know, because the Finland, we, we should, our, our moratoria are ending this uh, by the end of this month. And for for some reason there hasn't been any talk of, of continuing them, so we'll see. And the recovery fund is it's not so clear cut now with the Italian situation also. Though I don't know, we don't know how, how do, when do we get it ratified? Do we get it ratified? What will the what will Italy do? It's a uh, it's the Europe is also becoming a political mess. It's been brewing under the surface for for a while, but it's really like a yeah, uh, it's a big pile of done basically where okay. we are so i want to wrap it with this do you believe there is a war on cash and that the crypto experiment is happening so that the global population gets used to not using cash plus they could use the covid reason as it being a spreader of the virus i know i'm getting a new credit card it's going to be contactless where you just show it and oh, yeah. uh is there a big war against cash in in europe and your, your country as well where they're discouraging people from using cash and do you think we're going to move completely away uh from cash and to just a uh, digital that, type? That's, that, that's how it looks that's yeah. how it looks if like you know maybe maybe next time when i'm on we can talk about the 
to central bank digital currencies and the risks they pose to you know economic freedom and everything. They, this really oh, yeah, that's the end conflict. of economic freedom. The end, the end of cash. Yeah, that, yeah, that's the end. End of cash. And the, and the, if if central banks get their way, way and get the you know the digital currencies issued, then then we are really deep in a the hole. They can you know it, it, it's it's a dystopian kind of scenario. Yeah. I, was, I was just thinking about that word. You know, yeah. I used to watch them in the movies, and now I feel like uh, I'm living in the movie. Yeah. So yeah, that's the craziest thing, don't you? Yeah, it's so the same thing. surreal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, if, if we would have been talking a year from, uh, like, beginning of last year, past year about this, I would say that now probably wouldn't happen. No, no, that wouldn't happen. Now, now you now you kind of seeing that everything starts to happen right before your eyes, and you're wondering what the you know what is going on. Yeah. yeah. Who is pulling the strings? And we have to ask these questions because it seems that all the plans are have all, have been there already, which kind of you know scares me a bit. So where, where they are trying to take us, the you know, global elite or whatever you want to call them. But the, but the problem is that we really cannot say anymore that, they, they, that there could not be some kind of, you know, a, I don't know, conspirator, conspiracy is a, a, a difficult word, but something this, because it's, it starts to feel like planned. And that yeah. worries me quite a bit. Okay. Uh, I was going to ask you one more thing, but I, I, I forgot. So, um, you know, it's always, you know, good to talk to you, Thomas. I mean, we get a lot of Pollyanna stuff going on all the time. And I know everyone kind of feels it in their bones, what's going on here. Mm -hmm. And appreciate you bringing some numbers to back up your uh, narrative. And uh, you're kind of a watchman for us in, in Europe. Uh, appreciate you being here and uh, I'm going to bring you back as if we still have the internet in April <laughs> <laughs> yeah. for us, yeah. us yeah. to talk about, uh, yeah. you know. Well, then we can exchange letters if they, you know, let us. You know. I, I'm going to I'm going to go purchase a couple of uh, carrier pigeons. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, we could, could communicate that way, but yeah. uh, I, I appreciate you coming here and being a watchman and giving this side the coin for our community to consider and think about. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, Tom. And, and be safe and, and uh, let's talk again. We will do that. Sure. All right. I, my my, uh, my uh, good news, um, Trading Warrior brother, Thomas Melanin. Uh, thank him, everyone, and appreciate you being here. Thank you, Thomas. Thanks. Okay. It, it, was a, it was a pleasure again. Okay. Yeah. All right. By, uh, by uh, the way, on an unrelated ahead. note, uh, Thomas, since mm -hmm. you're finished, um, I, I've been actually impressed by how sh how many social policies you have in uh, in Finland. Huh? Uh, you know, uh, you Finnish people are uh, you know a very logical uh, type of people, and you know, since I have friends there, when I realize that you actually have a lot of uh, socialism and weird policies having to do with unemployment, etc. I was quite impressed. Uh, so, a comment from you? Yeah, we have a kind of a, in the in the when you, if you look at from the U.S. perspective, we have a kind of socialistic system, but it's all based all it has been based on a on our entrepreneurship and you know big corporations and and the very fundamentals of free market you know capitalism. That's how we got in it. But now we have this left uh, uh, left green government which is messing things up so it's a it's a bit of a worrisome picture whether we can hold on to these you know programs and and uh, and the welfare state we have but i think actually because i have also lived in the u.s so the uh, finnish model could be rather functional in, in many places in europe not not so much in in, in the u.s but in we could we could many countries could take examples from us that's for sure Okay. Yes. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Face. Uh, everyone, hope you enjoyed it. And uh, we'll have Thomas back here in the spring to see where we're at in the solvency yeah. crisis. And uh, uh, thank you, everyone. Have a great trading day. Adios. And we'll wrap up the week tomorrow. Don't just count your conspiracy stories. <laughs> count your blessings. And I'll see everyone later. See you tomorrow. Adios. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.